Uh, thank you, Rector. Thank you for your uh, introduction. And I'm very pleased to be here at your fine university and uh, visit S Sardinia. As the Rector said, this is my uh, first trip here. I've been to Italy many, many, many times over the years, but I've never had the opportunity. I've always wanted to come to Sardinia, so this gives me four days to travel around and get to know the people here. Um, before I begin, let me make it on the elections in the United States. Um, I want to make sure I clearly identify myself. I'm a Democrat. Uh, I'm not a Republican. <laughs> I was appointed by uh, President Obama, who's a personal friend. Um, and whatever I say here, you, you have to understand that uh, I have a long history of being a Democrat and active in uh, democratic uh, politics. My wife is a journalist, was a journalist. She covered every presidential campaign in one way or another since 1976. So together we're uh, we're very uh, experienced or very knowledgeable about uh, presidential campaigns. But before I begin to talk about that campaign, let me just give you a little bit of uh, history about America. I'm sure many of you know this already. Uh, our Constitution in 1787 uh, was drafted after the Revolutionary War. Uh, it has served as a model for the world. Uh, it was drafted by an extraordinary group of uh, people at that time. I don't think we've had assembled in America uh, a group quite as good uh, since, from Jefferson and Washington and Hamilton, and I've read much of that uh, history. The concept of the United States of America has really taken a, took a long time to take root. I mention that because of the European Union and the discussions here about whether this should be a United States of Europe. Um, it took decades for the Constitution itself to be both interpreted and accepted by the states. Um, questions like, should there be a federal bank? Should they be able to loan money? Should they maintain a standing army? Uh, what is the power of the federal government versus the power of individual states? Uh, most people thought of government as being just in their neighborhood, 40 kilometers away, and they didn't think so much of a real powerful federal government. But that's what uh, what has, has came over, became over time. And during that period, two parties emerged. We have a two-party system in America. Italy's a little bit different, as many other European countries are. We had the Federalists, meaning they're all for a powerful government. Remember, these, these states all came together because of a revolutionary war. They didn't necessarily want to combine with many other states, but they did out of necessity. They favor regulation. They favor um, um, being able to make decisions for the states. Um, this was called Federalist, and the, that was uh, the Hamilton group, then there was the Jefferson group called Anti-Federalist. They wanted power to devolve to the states. And that's been the debate, really, uh, over the years, and it continues to today. The Republicans and the Democrats really uh, are those two parties. Republicans are in favor of less government. Their emphasis is on free markets and less regulation. More emphasis on the responsibility of the individual to take care of himself or herself. The Democrats um, want a strong and active federal government. Uh, taking care of the less privileged. Um, income inequality is something they, they've always paid attention to. So this has been the tension of those two parties, and that's, uh, in summary, what, what the positions are today of, of the Democrats and the Republicans. Now, there are two other factors that helped shape America, uh, made it somewhat unique. One is that America is a land of immigrants. It's interesting today to consider, given the immigration issues facing really the United States and, and the world. Everybody who came to America came from somewhere else. My grandparents are Italian immigrants. They came over in 1902 just like many, many others in Europe, uh, seeking a better life and better opportunity. So that gives it sort of a unique character when you have everybody coming and leaving their homes behind, leaving everything behind and going to a new country across a big ocean to start a new life. The other factor that really has shaped America 
uh, in a bad way is slavery. Uh, slavery, it was just a scourge of slavery. It's unbelievable that we uh, had slaves brought over against their will, many of them from Africa, to service the ag uh, agrarian needs of the South and others. But we, because of that history, we pay a terrible price today. And there's a there's an element of racism, a stain of racism in America uh, that continues. And I think uh, President Obama, as a black uh, American, has... Uh, has significant opposition, primarily because he's uh, he is African American. He people just won't accept uh, maybe up to 20, 25 percent of the American uh, voters. So let me turn to the campaign and try to make some sense of it. I just say preliminarily that this year's campaign is like no other we've ever had or ever experienced. Uh, everybody uh, that I know reacts this way. If the Republicans nominate Donald Trump, which seems almost certain, and if the Democrats nominate Hillary Clinton, which also seems certain, uh, polls at this stage suggest and show that there, these two candidates are more unpopular uh, with the public than any previous race, races we've had in the last half century. Uh, the polling on Hillary uh, whom I know and have known, I think she's, uh, I think she's very good. Um, but it's negative because she's been around too long, 24 years uh, on the stage. And people, this is what the polling and the focus groups uh, show. And they want somebody new and somebody different. And they're uh, irritated by her manner and her style. These, these things uh, matter. But they think she's very smart and they think she's a very experienced. And I think she'd be a good president. I think she's not been a great candidate, but I think she'd be a good president. Uh, Mr. Trump has no experience in government whatsoever. Uh, he has made statements that many of you have seen, racist, xenophobic statements. Um, he appeals to anger. Uh, for America, and for many Americans, and for me, his, his rise uh, in this election year uh, across the world has been an embarrassment. Um, I've had the questions posed to me every day, just like all ambassadors do. Uh, what's happening to America? Uh, and you've all seen the kind of statements that he's made. What do they like about him? What is the public, the ones that are voting for him? They like that he's a, not in government. The anti-government movement uh, um, experience today has uh, reached, reached a real peak. I, I don't think it's really justified in, in terms of where the country is. He's a businessman, and he's a rich businessman, so they think he must be successful. He's very blunt. He tells it like it is. That's what they say. And he... Um, he empowers them to, to say things that they otherwise wouldn't say that could be considered racist. There have been, violence, been some violence at his rallies because the, he ramps up the, the anchor, anger level. I think most people that I know would be very, very worried with the prospect of a President Trump. But remember this, this is only a primary election. Primary means you select from a, each party who should be the nominee. The Republican Party makes up around 38, 39 percent of the electorate. And he has about 40 percent of that support. So that's something in around 16 or 18 percent. But it's been a very highly visible campaign. And uh, it's been very lucrative for all the um, stations that have been running the debates. They've had tremendous uh, uh, turnout and interest, which generates uh, profits, so it's it's much more pervasive this this campaign than normal. Uh, he appeals to lower educated uh, and underemployed people who are angry, um, those who blame immigration and uh, trade relationships uh, as on their plight. Um, those who don't think that their lives will get uh, a lot better. He appeals to that anger. Many are angry at government officials, their inability to get anything done, their threat to shut down the government, the paralysis that is, it has engendered, the default threat on our debt, uh, the language that they use, and the rise of the Tea Party, uh, 
which is a, a group that just says, shut everything down, don't cooperate, no compromises. Now, things will change going forward. There's a long way to go. We haven't even gotten to the conventions. And the four, four important events that will make a difference, that could make a difference, is the selection of a running mate, which will be done between now and July. It's the convention itself. Even though the convention will be determined before it opens and begins, it will be um, perceived as an effective convention or uh, ineffective one. How is their message being projected to all the voters? Because they do get a lot of people watching. It will be the three debates that they have every year between the two presidential candidates. And it will also be how popular is the incumbent party's president, in this case, uh, Mr. Obama. Well, his popularity is going up, and if you look at his legacy, it's very strong. And I think during the course of the campaign, it's going to become apparent that he's had a very successful presidency and that the country is on the right track. Unemployment, you know, he took over, it was a financial disaster, as we all recall, in 2008, 2009. Unemployment ramped up over 10%. Um, Growth was, was absolutely stopped, going negative. Uh, many, many millions of jobs were lost. Uh, so what's happened over eight years? Well, the unemployment has gone from 10% to 5%, cut in half. The GDP growth is growing and is roughly twice what Europe is. Very strong job creation. We're creating something like two and a half to three million jobs a year, something like 14 to 15 million jobs created so far. We now have rising wages as well and low inflation. Uh, he saved the auto industry that was very unpopular for him to do. 65% of the people said, let the auto industry go. Don't take them out of bankruptcy. Uh, well, we have a thriving automobile industry, Fiat Chrysler, with the help of Italy and Fiat uh, joining forces, and General Motors. Uh, they've never sold more cars, and it, that would have meant a million jobs. But President Obama felt that was extraordinarily important. We had to save it despite the opposition, and now, of course, it turns out that was uh, for certain the right thing to do. The stimulus package that he was able to get through, not as much as he liked, um, this is the same debate going on in Europe, stimulus versus austerity. I uh, spent close to a trillion dollars, 800 plus billion dollars, made a huge difference in getting all these jobs created. Health care. Health care is something that really does separate the parties. I mean, he on, put on a political risk of taking on health care, something that was very hard to do, and he was successful uh, at doing that. Um, so for today, we have more than 18 million people who have health care, who didn't have health care. Um, it's still a, a controversial issue, um, but he did it. Uh, he cut the deficit by two-thirds. We are now energy independent with the shale gas revolution. But why is it that he's been not had the popularity that you would think he would deserve? When he was here uh, not too long ago, and I said, Mr. President, uh, uh, your popularity here in Italy and all over Europe is over 80%. This is, your popularity in the United States is 40, 42%. Uh, his reaction was, yeah, I know I could be president of Europe if, I, if it was available. Uh, but the reason why he was, and now his popularity, by the way, is going back up. It's 50, 51, which is high. <clears throat> it's because the contrast of the other uh, Republican candidates, especially when you had Mr. Trump and Ted Cruz, who was his main competitor, they see how effective President Obama has been, and they worry about who's going to succeed him. Um, so that will be a big factor. If he has high popularity, if he's up to 55%, because typically in America, you don't have the same party in power uh, for eight years. Uh, it's usually hard to get another four years. People just want to change. And so that's the risk. But if you're doing well, if you're on the right track for all the reasons that I identified here, uh, then that's a big plus. Uh, the debate, all the things I, I mentioned, um, will play out. There have been lots of twists and turns with prior 
uh, races, which have changed dramatically in the last four, three and four months, uh, based on the debates, based on the conventions, as I mentioned. So I think, uh, I think right now, Hillary Clinton is polling ahead, significantly ahead in some polls, less so in others. My personal belief is once they understand the issues and the, and the characters, once they understand more about who Donald Trump is and his background, and if he continues making his same statements and outrageous comments without any support, they've done a survey to show that 75% of the facts that he re represents are wrong. But right now, those people who are supporting him don't seem to be bothered by that. We'll see. How, I can't predict what, what it's going to be like, but I know it's going to attract the attention of the world. The stakes are extremely high. Uh, these will be two very, very different presidents, presidents and um, uh, going, uh, going forward, um, I think the people will understand that. And I think I have confidence in our democracy. Also, Mr. Trump, and the polling I didn't mention before, about 70 people, 70% 70 of the people have said they under no circumstances would vote for him. That's pretty high. So I'm confident in the end of the day that our democracy uh, will work. And come November, um, Hillary Clinton uh, will be elected, but it's going to be a bumpy ride, a very bumpy ride. So thank you. Any questions? Yes, that's an excellent question and one point that I wanted to make. I think America, the greatest threat to America is money in politics uh, today. It is, based on a Supreme Court decision several years ago, uh, flooding the, uh, the campaigns in ways that are really distorting the outcome. I don't think it's that Im as important in a presidential campaign because the coverage is so extensive that people get a pretty good sense uh, of the candidates. But what I, when I mentioned before about President Obama's popularity, what's the difference? Why would he have 80% all over Europe and only 40% in the United States? It's because of money in politics. It's because he has been the target of the Republican uh, campaigns. They have uh, blamed him for every conceivable thing that's gone uh, wrong and things that he had nothing uh, to do with. So people hear this constant, with money, barrage of advertisements saying the health care program is a failed program. It's going to take away your benefits. Things are, are not true. A huge amount of money, po money in the, poli the pol political process, shaped those people's opinions because they were getting misinformation. And I'm convinced that's why. Uh, his po now his popularity, as I mentioned, is, go is going back up. It distorts the system where it's particularly harmful is in, uh, are in elections for members of Congress and the members of the United States Senate, and even more importantly, as, or as importantly, state legislators. Mil hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, and this is new since that Supreme Court decision, are being pumped into these campaigns, and it's all from special interest, mostly business interests. I think it's... Uh, it's very damaging. It's going to be hard to change because the Supreme Court um, decision says you, the corporations are people. I mean, as absurd as it sounds, they are people, and as such, they have a First Amendment right to speak, and money is speech. I mean, that's their reasoning. Now, as you know, we, you may know, we have a death on the Supreme Court. Uh, Anton Scalia. Uh, 
So there's a vacancy. These decisions are all 5-4. So he, and he was always on the majority, what, the conservative side. On, on Citizens United, he was the fifth vote. So this is why the election of the president is doubly important in America. It's going to absolutely affect the direction of the Supreme Court with that next appointment. There's someone nominated now, Merrick Garland, who's actually a good friend of mine, who's being, again, totally blocked by the Republicans in the Senate. You have to have a confirmation vote by the Senate, and so far that has not occurred. Uh, but this, this election will determine the direction of the Supreme Court. If Hillary Clinton is elected, we will get someone on the court that will reverse many of these decisions, not just Citizens United. Uh, if we get a Donald Trump, we will get just the opposite. So that's why the stakes are very high. But I totally agree. We have to do something with it. And if we can get the Citizens United case reversed, which I, th I think we can, that will be very, very important. Salve a tutti, mi chiamo Mariana Bralle e sono una qui. Ok. Eh, in merito alle imminenti elezioni negli Stati Uniti, poiché questi sono sempre stati caratterizzati da una struttura multietnica, quali potrebbero essere le conseguenze se il candidato alla presidenza, Donald Trump, dovesse vincere le elezioni in relazione alla sua politica nei confronti degli immigrati? Well, if you believe him and what he says, uh, his policy, as stated, is that he wants to have a program to round up and deport 11 million people now living in America. Something that will be impossible to do. Uh, whether he even tries to do that, um, I, can't, I can't believe it. It would never be uh, uh, able to be carried out. But he's totally, you know, he wants to build a wall in Mexico for hundreds of miles and make the Mexicans pay for it, which is what he always says. Uh, I think it will, be, it will be bad. But you know, one thing about Donald Trump, I don't think he is really an ideologue so much that he believes in those positions. Uh, he just says them for effect, and he does get a big, big response. The people, there's a lot of anti-immigration sentiment in the United States. There's more much for it than against it, but he's tapped into that real hostility to immigration. So uh, what, that's what he says he'll do. I don't think he'll be feasible at all. I think he'll hit resistance at every turn if you try to do that. Uh, but that would just be terrible for America to have to take a position like that, given its, its roots where everybody's an immigrant in America. And it's made America stronger, by the way. Immigration, I think, makes all countries stronger. We all have to be tolerant and understand that, uh, like Germany, for example, Angela Merkel understands that it, Germany needs a million people a year of immigrants to sustain their economy over time. That's why they're doing it. They know that because of the aging population, because of the demographics, most countries in Europe, uh, less so the United States, need immigration. And I know it puts a tremendous burden on communities and places because you have a big influx of people and you have to feed them and, and the media coverage is just uh, non-stop. But we have to step back and appreciate the, the benefit and the value of immigration and also the lives of these people, many of whom are escaping you know, life and death situations with their families. Can you imagine if you're in Syria with your family? And are you trapped there? You can't go anywhere? Uh, you know, we have to have some uh, compassion, I think. And uh, Donald Trump, I'm sorry to say, I haven't seen any compassion exhibited. Uh, good morning, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, my question is uh, about uh, outside uh, America. So the question is about uh, the next, what is the next, uh, um, the next president programs about the situation in Syria? Syria. Yeah, the yeah. situation. What will uh, America do uh, in Syria? Uh, might be, uh, my, uh, my question is about the strategy, military strategy. Yes. Uh, if there is a military strategy in Syria or uh, there is some solution in the future, so the situation is very, very bad. So uh, my question is about what, what America do for Syria? 
Well, obviously that's a that's a very important issue that's front and center today with Italy, uh, United States, Germany, all trying to figure out what to do with the tragedy of the Syrian people and how many millions of people, I mean half their country's been destroyed. What we, you know, we've, we're meeting again, our Secretary of State has uh, just had a uh, ministerial meeting with all the other countries to try to get Mr. Assad to step down. The big factor in, in this issue is Mr. Putin in, uh, in Russia, uh, who's come in with force, although he claims to be uh, not having as much, taking some of that force away, that has uh, destabilized what was real progress toward getting a solution and getting moving ahead and stopping the violence, getting these, there's a ceasefire that's being negotiated right now, they don't always work. So I think the objective is to get a ceasefire, come up with a plan, Mr. Assad has to be removed, and coming up with a new government. Uh, that's been the policy of the United States, of Italy, of everybody, of, the, of NATO, in trying to come up with a solution that I would hope would be, continue to be the policy of uh, uh, any anybody uh, as president. I don't think we're going to see a big change on that. It's a terrible situation. And it's terrible for the people who've had to endure it. And uh, it, it gets a high priority uh, attention from our government and will continue to do so certainly as long as President Obama is there. Se eh, la Clinton dovesse essere la candidata dei democratici alla presidenza, quale potrebbe essere il suo candidato vicepresidente o comunque che tipo di profilo i democratici andranno a ricercare? Grazie. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know, I haven't talked to her about it. <laughs> I don't think she'd... I don't think she's made up a, her mind right now. I think, you know, in choosing a vice president, you will always look to both balance the ticket in terms of, um, not geography, but if you're looking at what they call battleground states that are the critical states, whether it's Florida, Ohio, North Carolina, I mean there's like 12 battle, they call them, that's where the elections determine, it can go either way. That oftentimes a candidate will try to choose somebody very well qualified from one of those states also. Gender. I mean, the names that have been suggested are Senator Tim Kaine from Virginia, whom I know well. I think he's outstanding. He's been a governor. He's now a senator. Extremely well liked. Extremely effective. It's, he's, Virginia is an important state. Some suggestion has been raised that uh, Elizabeth Warren, who's the senator from Massachusetts, who decided not to run for president, uh, she would have been a very strong candidate. And I think uh, a lot of Articles have been written and suggested that had she decided to run, that she would have been the nominee. Now, will uh, she appeals to that same base that Bernie Sanders, whom I didn't mention in my remarks, Bernie Sanders, this 74-year-old guy, has just caught fire with young people. And uh, he gets big crowds. Now, he's not going to win. Uh, but he's really ramping up what they call the Democrat base. These are people who are upset about income inequality, they're upset about the fact that college education is unaffordable now. In America it is, by the way, and I hope you appreciate what you get here in Italy in terms of the support of education by your government. Because now public education is, is uh, much less public, it's much more uh, private. So they're upset, and Bernie Sanders says, oh, we'll have free education for everybody, free health care, we'll change this. Well, that sounds good. It's, it's um, completely unrealistic in terms of the costs associated with that. And most importantly, in case of Bernie Sanders, he's been in the Senate and the House of Representatives for a long time. He's never been a Democrat. He's been a self-proclaimed socialist. He's never been able to get any legislation through in his entire um, government career. There's nothing with his name on it, but he speaks to the to the interest. This is the other side of the Trump group. These are highly educated young people that are upset <coughs> with the issues I just mentioned, and Bernie Sanders addresses those issues, but he doesn't have any realistic uh, a solution. So Elizabeth Warren addresses those issues too, and she's much more pragmatic. Will Hillary Clinton choose another woman? Will there be two women? You know, we've never had a woman president or a woman vice president. Would they have a ticket that has a, 
as a president and a vice president, two women. I don't know. It could be. I think it would be an interesting ticket. Um, but it, there are four or five names mentioned. We, we, we won't know. I'm, I'm, I'd bet on Tim, Tim Kaine, the guy I mentioned before. It would be a good choice. Well, I hope so. I'd have to say America's policy on guns is absolutely crazy. It's indefensible. Uh, it, it, we are just, um, I mean, the world can't understand how we could have over 300 million guns in circulation in America. This is an issue I've cared deeply about and spent a lot of my career working on trying to get sensible, reasonable gun regulations in, in place. But uh, it's very hard because we have an organization called the National Rifle Association that's powerful, that intimidates our members of Congress because they threaten. If you don't vote with them, they will raise money to go against you, and they do. And so as a consequence, we can't get anything reasonable passed in our, in our Congress. Now, you have to keep with that issue. I know Hillary Clinton's position on gun, gun control is a good one. You know, it's incremental. You just can't come in and, and what they always claim you're going to do, take everybody's guns away. No one's proposing that. But there are a lot of proposals that will make sure you, you have background checks and people that buy them, that you'll uh, uh, get rid of military-style weapons, you know, uh, that you, people can buy now with magazines. And you read about these shootings that go on in a movie theater or a hospital. These are the military weapons that people can get. Now, that's crazy. I mean, there's no way I can defend on behalf of my country that policy. I think it's terrible. And it's, you know, and... Americans don't appreciate how alone we are in the world by the gun policies that we have. And they don't appreciate how many deaths occur per, per population. We are like 20 times higher per population than I'm sure Italy or Japan. We're like 40 times higher. You know, it's, uh, it's crazy. And I, I, people keep working on it. And I think at some point we're going to have to make that change. And it's just been really difficult. Eccellenza, molti autorevoli commentatori stanno mettendo in luce come il sistema eh, delle primarie americane eh, sia in qualche modo da riformare perché non sarebbe sufficientemente democratico. Ad esempio, eh, alcuni mettono in evidenza come le regole tra gli stati siano molto diverse, alcuni stati votino molto presto, potendo influire, e influire quindi maggiormente eh, sul risultato della campagna, oppure come la conta dei delegati eh, non garantisca sufficientemente, eh, solo pensando alla presenza dei superdelegati, la democraticità dell'intero processo. Lei condivide eh, questi, questi punti, queste argomentazioni? e nel caso come riformerebbe questo sistema? Grazie. Uh, well, you, uh, you've identified the issue. The, right now, uh, election rules are set by each individual state, and they vary. Um, you know, it wasn't too long ago that for primary, there weren't any primaries, that the determination as to who will, rep who will represent the Republican Party or the Democratic Party was made by party officials. And it really didn't change significantly until the election of 1912, when uh, Teddy Roosevelt tried to run as a third party. I think right now we have a more democratic primary system than we've, uh, we've ever had, but you are right. They vary state to state to state. Overall, if you look at votes cast and who's getting the delegates, it's a pretty fair representation. Uh, whether you should have a federal rule saying everybody, every state will follow the same rules, uh, that runs against the grain of states' rights, and every state should be able to um, determine its own rules. What we have in America that's not good is our states and parties trying to limit the access that people have uh, to the ballot box. I mean, for example, they say you have to have a voter ID to be able to vote. Well, that discriminates uh, against minorities, mostly on older people, who don't have 
But that's why they enacted. That's why they went. There's no voter fraud. They say that. There's no evidence of voter fraud. And they limit the times that you, you can vote. They limit the number of places that you can vote. They, they, uh, everything that they've done is this Republican initiative in some states is designed to discourage people from voting. That's terrible. And you have a Supreme Court, by the way, that on a 5-4 vote upheld and turned uh, overturned a rule that was designed to review every state's attempt to change those rules. And that's another issue that a new Supreme Court, a new justice, would be able to revisit that issue, and I think they would reverse it. But I think, you know, it's pretty democratic if you look at the votes cast and who gets the delegates. I'm not a Republican, so it's not something uh, I can do. But you're right. There's no question what's happened with uh, Mr. Trump. He's captured the uh, Republican Party in a way that is a, a, totally against what most of the party regulars, those in Washington, those who've been controlling the apparatus of the party, had intended. In fact, they're, they're appalled by the notion that Donald Trump could be the Republican nominee. They especially are concerned about the risk that he will affect all the elections in the House and in the House of Representatives and in the Senate, and that they would stand a real risk of losing the, substan the majorities that they have now. And I think that's true. I think that is a risk. So uh, you're right to identify that uh, uh, the party regulars um, have absolutely no support for, for Mr. Trump, but they're stuck. And a lot of this they brought on uh, themselves, of stoking the anger that the, many of the which has been written about a lot. Many of the uh, Republicans didn't stand up before in their own party when they were making, you know, some, taking similar actions that give rise to, <coughs> to racism, xenophobia, and immigration, all those issues. Uh, this is a real wake-up call for the Republican Party, and they stand to have devastating consequences from this if it goes uh, to the point where uh, Mr. Trump is nominated, then loses very badly by a 15-point margin or so that almost ensures that there'll be a turnover to Democratic control of the House and the Senate. So that's up to them to fix their party. Every party makes their own rules, and, um, you know, it's, it's nothing the government can do. Well, I, I think it's over because it's mathematically pretty much impossible for Bernie Sanders to get enough, enough delegates necessary to get the nomination. And if you see the incremental count week to week, um, Hillary Clinton has a substantial lead. Now, a lot of those votes that she has come from what are called, um, um, I mean, party delegates. There's a portion of the delegates that are selected by the party that they have a vote. And so typically, they're like every senator has a vote, every House member of the House of Representatives has a vote. They're not elected, but they have a vote. And she is getting 90% of those, which will give her enough to get the nomination. So, um, you know, that's a real question for Bernie Sanders as he's, you know, as he travels the country. He's getting enormous crowds, but there's no way he can be the, the nominee. And I think the, the, he is a Democrat. He's running as a Democrat. 
that the question will be when is Bernie Sanders going to understand that he will not be able to get the nomination so therefore he should do everything to get his voters to support the candidacy of Hillary Clinton because that issue came up just last week and he was asked well will you throw your support of your people not that he controls them all once you decide not to uh, proceed on the theory that you can't win to Hillary Clinton and his response was no, that's, that's everybody's individual decision to make. Now that's not a good response because when asked back in 2008 when Hillary Clinton was running against Barack Obama in the primary, she finally did drop out you know, around this time. And when she was, what she did is to say, I'm now dropping out, I want everybody to get behind Barack Obama because he's clearly the best candidate for president. That's what we need to see, uh, Mr. Sanders. And, you know, you got this guy. Uh, as I mentioned, he's he's had the ride of his life. He's been out there <laughs> getting huge crowds, and and uh, I've not I've not been to any of them, but I see them on television in ways that he can't quite believe. They like, he's getting young people. I mean, huge uh, percentages uh, of of young people. So I'm sure it's hard for him to say the game is over. He's also raising. He has been raising 50 million dollars a month on small contributions. He always says average $27 per person. That's quite a feat. That's quite a feat. Now I think those are trailing off as it becomes clear that he has no uh, clear way to get the nomination. Um, but we got to, Democrats have got to come together and as, as they did in 08 when you know the very strong feelings about Hillary Clinton running then against this new upstart president uh, or candidate Barack Obama. But in the end, they all did coalesce around uh, Barack Obama's candidacy and did elect him with a pretty significant margin. So we'll we'll see we'll, how that. I think you know he may just he may just want to be able to continue to raise the issues, and that gives him the ability to influence and shape the policy of the party. He certainly has pushed Hillary Clinton to the left. I don't think there's any question about that, so he can take credit for that to the extent that that was his objective, and I think it was. But we'll see. Okay. I think that's all for today.